Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is the event uh, uh, of a series called uh, Talking with the Author. Today we have uh, Dr. Arnie Gunderson, who is the uh, nuclear engineer and energy advisor of the United States. He has authored a book uh, entitled Truth and Prospect of uh, Fukushima Daiichi Nuclear Power Plants. Ganda um, uh, Dr. Gunderson was born in 1949, and he was involved uh, with the uh, designing, construction, operation, and decommissioning of nuclear power plants uh, in the whole of the United States as an engineer. 18th of March, uh, immediately after the uh, nuclear accident in Fukushima of last year, he appeared on CNN and he stated that meltdown had been already occurring. Today he will be speaking from the position of an expert regarding the cause, current status, uh, as well as the countermeasures going forward of the accident. This is Nagai from Simul International, and I am Ida of uh, Japan Television, who, uh, and I'm a member of the planning committee of this uh, press club. I will be the moderator today. So, uh, Dr. Gunderson will be talking for about an hour, including consecutive interpretation, which will be followed by a Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is it okay? Um, I'm Arnie Gunderson. I live in Vermont. And um, uh, all of my life, I have worked on Mark I reactors very similar, if not identical, to uh, uh, Fukushima Daiichi. And... Um, I would like to thank everyone for, for coming today. And I would also especially like to thank Shueisha um, for, for sponsoring the, the tour and for um, uh, publishing my viewpoint of the accident and the, and the view forward. I hold a, a bachelor's and a master's degree in nuclear engineering. And I was a senior vice president in, a, um, in the nuclear industry in the United States. Um, I also have a license to uh, operate a, a nuclear reactor, and I hold a nuclear safety patent. It but at the beginning of my career, I, uh, the first reactor I worked on was a Mark I, um, almost identical to um, Daiichi Unit 1. And then later in my career, I also worked on um, um, Mark IIs and Mark III's. Um, and um, when I was a senior vice president, I had uh, approximately 400 people working for me, and I've personally been in about 70 nuclear power plants during my career. It the, the first thing I would like to say is that I, I need to express my personal appreciation to the, to the very brave men um, and, and, and women, but mainly men, at, at both uh, Daiichi and, and Danai uh, for the effort that they made during the very first week and two weeks uh, at the beginning of this accident. Um, not only their personal bravery uh, saved uh, the nation of Japan, and, and it also saved um, the world, I believe. And so um, we all owe a debt of gratitude, and I personally feel a debt of appreciation uh, to the people on the plant site that, that worked so hard in such an awful condition and, and very likely saved the country. They are very brave men. The Mark I design has had a long history of, of problems. Um, in 1972, uh, I had just gotten out of college, and the, um, within the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the Mark I design was known to be too small. The, um, the amount of power in a very small enclosure um, was, uh, was unique. And all of the other re nuclear reactors that were built at that time had much larger containments than the Mark I design. So um, there are memos, and um, they are available, but if you'd like me to email you, I can, uh, of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission saying, in 1972, we never should have licensed this Mark I design, but because we did, if we were to stop now, uh, it would stop the nuclear industry from ever developing, and we're free. In 1976, I had moved on and was working on a Mark III reactor, 
and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission required a test of that reactor, and they discovered that the pressure was not down, but was up. And as a result of that test, they realized that the Mark I design would have lifted off the ground had there been an accident. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission required large straps to be put over top of the Taurus to prevent this uplift force in 1976. So that was the first modification to a design that was already too small. Hey, thank you. Then in, in 1979, when the Three Mile Island accident happened, there was a hydrogen explosion inside the containment of Three Mile Island. Um, the, the nuclear industry never assumed that hydrogen could be generated. And as a result of that, over about 10 years, again, the Mark I design was modified to add a containment vent. So the, the vent sort of was exactly the opposite of a containment. The purpose of a containment is to hold the radiation in, but the vent was added because the containment couldn't do that, and they needed an escape valve to allow the hydrogen to escape, or else the containment would fail. The, um, when my wife and I, um, every day we take a walk through our neighborhood, in February, right before the accident, three weeks before the accident, we were walking through our neighborhood in Vermont, and she said, you know, we do a lot of nuclear consulting, and we find a lot of problems. Where did I think the next nuclear accident would occur? And, and I told my wife this. I told her, I don't know where it will occur, but it will occur in a Mark I reactor. It so the first part of the problem was that the Mark I design is the weakest containment um, in, the, in the nuclear fleet. The second problem was the seismic issues um, at, at the, the Fukushima site, but, but also in Japan in general. The, the, um, you, know, you have much worse earthquakes than almost anywhere in the world. The, um, the, the, when the plant was built in, in 1970 through 78, I, I believe that there was no... Um, um, that the seismic conditions were understood to the best of the ability of the people who built the plant. But then in the 80s, and then especially in the 90s, um, the, we began to realize that, um, that, that, that this area and Japan in general could have a, a more severe earthquake and a more severe tsunami than, um, than, than um, Daiichi was ever designed for. So the second problem was that for tr at least the last 20 years, there was enough information to indicate that, um, that Daiichi and, and Danai should have been modified for a larger tsunami and a larger earthquake, and it didn't happen. This so the third piece of the puzzle was the fact that the um, regulator here in Japan and Tokyo Electric were, um, were too closely associated. And I don't think I need to go into too much detail here on that. So the, the, there were three pieces that came together on 311. The first part is the Mark I design. The second part is um, seismic knowledge that was ignored. And the third part was the, um, there was the close relationship between the regulator and Tokyo Electric. I don't think that this problem is unique to Japan. I've seen it in, in the United States, and I've certainly seen it in Europe as well. And I'm concerned in developing countries where they're just beginning to use nuclear power that this relationship between the regulator and the person who owns the power plant is, um, um, is too cozy. We call this an echo effect. If you get a bunch of people in a room, and they all agree, all they hear is each other's um, reinforcement. And, and the problem here, um, perhaps more than in America, but, but uh, again, I don't believe Japan is unique. The problem here is these, this echo effect, and um, myths were perpetuated. When I um, look back on the accident, I think there's several um, uh, several key issues 
that the nuclear community worldwide needs to uh, needs to understand before we go forward and build another nuclear power plant. The first one, and the most difficult to quantify, is the issue of the, the plant's design bases. And what that means is what um, engineers and scientists agree is the most powerful event that the plant can reasonably be expected to uh, withstand. In, in my world of nuclear power, we, I live in a world of um, severe accidents but very low probability. And it's very difficult in day-to-day -day life to understand that once in a hundred years is not enough of a, of a threshold. We need to be looking at a once in 20,000 year threshold in order to make sure that an accident like Fukushima doesn't happen at, um, uh, at a plant somewhere in the world on the average of about once every 10 years. We need to set the threshold higher. But the second area is um, seismic issues. And it appears that um, um, Fukushima um, Daiichi Unit 2 and Unit 3 um, likely survived the earthquake uh, and were um, uh, destroyed by the tsunami. It is not clear that Daiichi Unit 1 survived the earthquake. So there's lessons that we need to discover over the next years when we go back into Unit 1 to see if it really did withstand the earthquake. The, um, what, what Tokyo Electric and what the Nuclear Regulatory Commission um, seems to be focusing on is something we call the loss of off-site power. Uh, and certainly when the tsunami came, it, it destroyed the diesels on uh, at least um, Daiichi units 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And, um, but perhaps on Daiichi 6, uh, at least one diesel survived. The, um, the, the diesels were placed in the basement because the, when you have a large weight and you're in a country that has large earthquakes, you don't want the weight very high. So there was a logic back in 1970 when the plant was built um, to put the diesels in the basement. But now it's clear that um, the diesels were placed in the wrong location. And in fact, they could have as knowledge of the magnitude of a tsunami um, happened over 20 years ago, the diesels could have been moved up the hill and they would not have affected the performance of the plant. But it would have cost it about $100 million to do so. The, the other issue that happened at Fukushima, and we are just beginning to understand it um, in the nuclear community, is not the loss of power but the, what we call the loss of the ultimate heat sink. The, um, if you look at the pictures of the, the uh, plant site immediately after the tsunami, there are pumps that were right along the ocean. And those pumps were designed to cool the plant. The diesels took that water and ran it through the nuclear reactor, but the pumps all failed. Um, had the diesels survived, you still would have had meltdowns at Fukushima because the pumps along the ocean were inundated also because of the tsunami. I was contacted by a, a, a retired Japanese pump engineer about um, four weeks after the accident. And he said, you need to look at um, Dainé. The pumps survived at Dainé where they failed at Diachi. They were a different design. Um, so th there were lessons learned as, as these reactors were built at Dainé that never were reincorporated in, in Diachi. The uh, second problem, and perhaps even more difficult to fix, will be this issue of the cooling pumps along the ocean and um, how to protect them. The pumps on the ocean have to be at the ocean. It's not like the diesels that you can move them up high. The pumps on the ocean have to be at the ocean because that's where the cooling water is. So um, a, a more difficult problem looking forward is um, how to move these, how to protect these safety-related pumps.